Uh, so this is probably just a little bit of a, you know, a, a gear shift. I'm going to talk about um, our experience with integrating and exploring DPDK in a, in a product. So integrating it um, into an application that already exists uh, and the challenges that, 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 uh, that we encountered along the way. I'm Roger Melton, by the way, from Cisco Systems, and I'm, I know I'm looking at you over my glasses. When my father did that, I thought he was angry. I'm not angry with you guys. <laughs> I just can't see you unless I do that, and I can't see my slides unless I have my glasses on. Um, but I work uh, in the Enterprise Networking Group uh, at Cisco in the Data Plane Technology <coughs> Team. Um, and I'm just going to give you a little background on on the products we work on, not anything deep, just a quick overview, no real details because I'm not allowed to. Um, and then just give you an idea of what we did with our experimentations and observations we made and, and where we think we're going. Um, so our data plane, what I work on is the iOS XE data plane. Uh, it's it's a large shared code base uh, with a common architecture. It runs across uh, many different platforms. Uh, on Cisco ASICs with thousands of cores, it runs um, on commercial multi-core, so on ARM, on MIPS, on x86, or on a commercial multi-core in various hypervisor environments. So it's you know quite the number of different platforms that we have to support with this common code and common architecture. The, the performance range for this code is anywhere from 50 megabits to 200 megabits and beyond, or gigabits and beyond. Um, we build with legacy tool chains, uh, to modern tool chains. We use open source GCC, custom GCC, depend, you know, for some of our ASICs as well. Uh, we use ICC and Klein. Uh, so lots of tools that we have to use. Um, we work all the way back to the 26 3x kernel. So, you know, if you're depending on things in DPDK and modern kernels, sometimes we don't have them in the older kernels. So we have to we have to deal with that. Uh, we have to support both 32-bit and 64-bit applications. And as I said earlier, it's anywhere from a single core, uh, multi-threaded, to thousands of cores with the same code. Uh, it's it's deep in a layered system, so we're not sitting on a you know, a Unix or Linux command line, you know, typing in the, the, the RTEEL, you know, args, where that's all got to be integrated into the system. Um, so I, I think probably our reasons for experimenting with DPDK were similar to everybody's. We, you know, first and foremost, it was performance. Um, so, you know, how do you get that? For us, there's many different ways, but reduce system calls. So, you know, Pomo drivers help with that quite a bit. Um, simplified I.O. batching, so, you know, bursts and, and bulk. Um, no ISR, uh, you, core utilization is very helpful. Um, you know, it's easier to debug a Pomo driver when it's in user space than when it's in the kernel. So if you're writing your own drivers or hacking them, it's, uh, it's, it does help there. Um, the fact that your, your memory is now isolated from the kernel is helpful as well. So your, your, your application can crash without taking down the entire system. So we, we approached this in, in two phases. We had uh, first just an experiment to integrate it into our data plane. So it, it was quite a task to, to do full integration where we integrate with our control plane and our data plane and the entire system in itself. So we started off with just integrating into the data plane. Um, and our, our primary interest was trying to get to, to integrate it for I.O. I mean, getting packets in and out as fast as we could was what our goal was. Uh, and of course, if you're going to bring I.O. in with DPDK, you got to bring some other things too. So you, you have to have the memory and buffer management. You have to have some thread management where if, if those threads are using DPDK APIs, then it's, it's you know, some of them are required uh, to be DPDK RTEL cores. So, um, so it's safer to make those threads uh, DBK threads. Um, 
we decided in that phase to just adopt the, the sort of standard build environment and runtime environment, so no cross com compilation we were using. I think when we started it was Fedora 16 at that time. Um, so we built DPDK in the normal way that everybody's used to. We, we, we built our data path. Actually, the harder thing for us was taking our data path and building it on a, on a Fedora system than, uh, than actually using DPDK at, the, at that time. And then we just linked at the dynamic libraries um, as you're used to. Um, then after that, once we, we saw that this looked like it was going to be a valuable uh, pursuit, we decided to uh, do full integration into our build environment. We have a custom grown build environment, so we, we can't use DPDK uh, uh, build environment. We had to replicate that to a degree within our environment. Um, and then integrating it into our runtime environment. So this system boots up, it's, it's running uh, Linux, you know, we have init scripts that go out and initialize interfaces, all these things we had to do in order to, to use data plane, uh, DPDK in our data path. And then our control plane had to be uh, a, a modified in order to, to manage this as well. It knew quite a bit about the underlying uh, physical devices, I guess, and, and to do physical device management. Yeah, just to go back to that, if we found that we needed some infrastructure within um, DPDK to try and abstract out this whole concept. So we've actually got a namespace map away. So we've got a namespace map away. You go off and you can ask it, hey, given the port, tell me the equivalent Linux name. Or So you've got to do that mapping, and when you start... Yeah, but, yeah, when you start looking at multiple architectures, that's got to come in. So we'll let Stephen submit his code because it's probably less buggy than ours. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, a lot of internal, we, we, we made the conscious decision to use the same naming algorithms as the guys do for systemd, um, so that the distro name is related to the internal name. So we could, exp I mean, we could work with those guys and expose that algorithm. Um, it's fairly straightforward. Yeah, but it's, when you start looking at things, you find that you really need it. Yeah, yeah, you do need it. Um, and it would be yeah. actually useful, for, I think, for people to be able to say, I've got this PCI device, what would it be named in the NetDev systemd world? Right, I mean, and, you know, as, as mentioned, we're working with a pretty old distribution, if you will. So we're UDEV, right? So oh, system D subsumed UDEV. Yep. They subsumed everything else. Yeah. Right. And they developed the policy set of rules. And as good as any other, I mean. It, yeah, it's just, it's, it's different, use. right? It's, it's different. I, that, <coughs> my point was it, you know, if you're using UDEV versus system D, yeah. as long as you can adopt it and, and you can use it, independent of which uh, device management yeah. you're using, that's, that's important. Um, so the next slides are just about observations we made as, as we went through this process. And we started actually, um, you know, when we started playing around with it, I think, you know, it was DPDK 1.3 something when we first just picked it up and, <laughs> and played with it. And we, by the time we got really involved with it, we were at 1.6. Um, so one of the first things we ran into, and I'm sure other people have hit it too, was uh, you know if you're if you have a multi-threaded application that needs to scale down to a single core, um, it was it was not possible, right? We you know DPDK said you know one L core per physical core, so um, that was a challenge for us, and we we um, I, I'm sure as others did. I talked to Larry sitting over here on the front row. Quite a bit about that. We talked to them about the issue, and, and fortunately, in DPDK 2.0, that problem has been solved for us. So now, you know, we can we can start multiple threads on m multiple L cores on a single single core. There are a number of different ways to do it. Uh, so that that's really helped us out a lot. Um, you know, another another issue we had. Uh, I think Stephen, you'd mentioned it yesterday. Was you know, uh, and it got mentioned again today. You know, in a VM environment, you know, new map lies. So, you know, we had some issues with that where, you know, we're, we're bringing up the system and, you know, we you have things like uh, uh, physical device ID being used and in the VM environment that may or may not be true, right, depending on how you've got that, that VM configured. 
Um, one of the other, probably one of the more difficult tasks we had was um, was that UIO eliminated those traditional you know Unix Linux ways of getting to to managing devices. So you know IF config, tool, all those things were were gone. Um, and you know our control plane uses them to do physical device configuration. So it was an easy way for us to do it before DPDK. We could just go, you know, use those APIs, use the IOCTLs, and, and everything worked fine. Um, but with UIO, the device is gone. We had no access to those APIs. Um, and we looked at, uh, yeah. I, I'm having a hard time hearing you. So, do we have the 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 mic? Oh, Andy's got it. We are trying with some some of the devices, and we start with the, with the Melanox to, to have the, the the PMDs, which is the kind of bifurcated logics. And did you try to, to use it for the ETH two and us others? And if yes, did it match uh, your needs? We we did not try the Melanox. Now we we talked about. Uh, to, to Intel about the bifurcated drivers coming for the, um, uh, yeah, um, and and the issue we have there is we have to support many many different types of NICs. So if if we can, if every NIC didn't provide a bifurcated solution, then it, it's we have to have multiple solutions. So we were looking for a single. And some, some I'm trying to understand it could be bifurcated driver solution because there, there are some security issues with the bifurcated driver. And try to understand let's say if the model works for you as a user, because as six we same, we have some, some some similar needs. So if it works for you, just as I was saying yesterday, maybe it's become very important that we push a kind of a rewrite or update of all the PMD one by one. Of course, the world will not change in a day. Right. So so this. Um, where we ended up going was this eTool API that we worked with Intel on. Um, and today, um, those APIs have been pushed into IXGB, IGB, Vert IO, right? Is that right, Larry? <coughs> okay, that's not so, so IGB, but, but we will be working to push those into Vert IO, VMX Net3, so that you know, the other pole mode drivers can take advantage of these. That's the next workaround, but it means we, we keep stacking on, on the problem instead of, let's say, removing the, pro the, the problem. So we, we keep increasing the complexity of the open source maintenance of the DPDK. Yeah. Okay. Mm. I'm pretty sure Steve has some comments I about the situation. Anything we have to change 100 drivers, it will get to at some point. That's going to be a real problem. Right. Well, if, if, you integrate a new driver and adapt, adapt it at that time, or adopt well, it at that, that time. The barrier to entry is that much higher than the next one. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, but still, I mean, it's you know, I, I think we'll be faced with problems like that, and you know, you have to take them on a case by case basis. And that doesn't mean this is the best solution. It's what we came up with and what worked for us. Um, and if there's a better way to do it, you know, we'd certainly consider it as well. So we, like I said, we looked at K&I. K&I didn't work for us because it only supported IGB and IXGBE. Um, K&I also had some other limitations. It was it didn't support 32-bit compatibility ioctals. So if you're if you need a 32-bit uh, application in a 64-bit kernel, it it didn't work. So we we limped along for a while by just hacking K&I to allow us to do I, IGB IXGBE, uh, but that wasn't a long-term solution. And the bifurcated driver, um, while interesting, as I said, it didn't support all the NICs, and uh, it's, it was a little heavyweight for what we wanted to do as well, as was K&I, because all we're trying to do was really get to the device. We weren't actually, we had no interest in sending packets back and forth to the kernel network stack, uh, you know, so that all that extra functionality wasn't really interesting to us. In fact, it was baggage that we had to carry if we if we would pursue that. So we, we decided to pursue the, uh, the e tool uh, approach, uh, and I'm sure you know we could talk about that more in one of the lightning or, or the open mic things if people are interested in talking about that more later. Yeah, and Larry's uh, Larry Wang here has got a paper where we discuss different ways of doing it. As Roger said, there's trade offs all over the place. Yeah. Um, you know, let's get the collective IQ points in. There's some code sitting there ready to go into 2.2. So 
people want to look at it. Um, you know, I'm open for other suggestions. As Roger said, we, got, we needed this problem, we scratched the itch. Um, we've got something that hasn't seemed to fail. It does have the issues that Stephen pointed out where you end up replicating lots of other stuff. There are other things suggested in the paper that are more hybrid type things, but uh, you know they need it. Again, we need to think about them a bit more. <laughs> it hasn't been published yet. So. <laughs> it's it's on Larry's laptop. You have dev at dpdk.org, and we have it in five minutes. <laughs> What's that? You can send it on dev at dpdk.org, and we have it in five minutes. Uh, okay. There you go. And then last time we posted to dpdk.org, we uh, caused a bit of a stir. I think we have the most number of uh, check-ins. I think we got to 17, and then just like all good managers, we renamed it so it went down a bit. But, uh, <laughs> you know, we want to. Well, we, we've got up our profile now. At that point, we were trying to keep a local, pro, a lower profile because of. Um, I guess the Ericsson guys said it best, the internal politics. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of internal politics. There's a, also, we were drinking from the DPDK fire hose, right? We're, we're trying to learn it, we're trying to adopt it in our environment. It, it's, you know, we weren't comfortable at actually coming out and contributing until we had our feet on the ground. So we're, you know, hopefully we're there now. I will not comment on that. It's just what is beautiful. Just one comment about the, the the polling. Did you try and because I've been trying and we we find to, to use a kind of dynamic RSS. So for instance, all the course is there. Most of the course of DPKs could be sleeping, and the RSS. Let's say everything is tiered to one course, or at least one course keep being busy, or one L course in case of DPKs, and then we add some RSS queues, we remove some RSS queues depending on let's say, the, the workload and when we attach RSS queue to the L cores and we this L cores start to, to to run. So it's a bit of kind of compromise because you need to estimate the workloads, but uh, sometimes we, we can Yeah, at the moment what we do is we speculatively sleep. Um, so we we if if as long as our data path is busy everything is fine, right? I assume we're, we're talking about that 100% uh, PND uh, RX core <coughs> occupation. Um, so at the moment, if if we end up in a situation where all of our all of our ports go idle, um, we have some hysteresis. We'll sit there and pull for a bit, and then after a while, we just we do a short sleep. So you know, if there are other ideas about better ways of uh, you know uh, doing a quick sleep and wake up. Um, that that would be helpful. Uh, we're we're not very efficient at that, right now. Uh, but that's that's what we do. What about scaling frequency Well, we're in an environment where we don't have control of it. So yeah, um, I, I, we played with the same game, and we also I decided not to do the frequency scaling because you're running on a VM where you you have no access. So it you know the worst case is on a VM, and then you're not going to have any access to that. Um, and if you're on bare metal, it probably doesn't matter as much. That's right. Um, the other, I, mean, I played around with a whole lot of different hysteresis algorithms, and you know, some were awful, and most of the obvious ones were fine. Um, the, the interrupt stuff helps a lot, um, uh, but it's once again, it, the, you need it to support on every device before it gets interesting. Yeah, that, that's in, until it's there everywhere. We have to have multiple solutions, right. and that makes it hard. Um, some of the other stuff with the uh, interop, I, I have a bullet on it later, but we may as well talk about it. Was uh, you know the, the we needed the ability to have uh, individual interrupts from every port, and then we need to be able to you know let's say I, a, a link comes up or goes down, or I shut a link so it's no longer. But I'm waiting on that guy, right? He's off yeah. waiting on it. I want to be able to remove it from the event loop, right? So there's some things we need to be able to do to solve those sorts yeah. of problems as well. So. Yeah, but just like Stephen was saying yesterday, I mean, Cisco, we've been using the nappy-like thing since 1993. It's an obvious thing. Somebody took away our toys. We need them back. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, and with that, you know, you 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 you're you can still have a little heuristics, but they're way less sensitive. You know, you may want to say, "I'm busy. I was busy. I'll keep pulling," but you know. The wake up time is so much. Oh, the other well, thing, that's the, the other, problem. Right. The, other, the other thing that was helpful on this, um, and I'll mention my, is it turns out if you're 
mark those threads as real-time threads, they wake up much faster. Um, the, yeah, we, the normal kernel scheduler, if you say, I want to sleep for 100 microseconds, 100 microseconds, maybe 500 microseconds, right. it doesn't care. But if you say you're a real-time thread, it's going to say, okay, the clock's 100 microseconds, here you go. Yeah, yeah we've played with that too. It's um, really, I mean, that's surprisingly accurate. But if, if you're in a VM, the other problem is, you know, you've now got a scheduling opportunity for right, yeah. you know, to go off and let the host do something else for a while. So that's, that's a, the, the lack of determinism there is a problem, right? And the other, the other weird thing about that whole thing is um, how long you sleep ends up getting totally interacted with P states and C states mm -hmm. on the processor, and it's really... Right. So, in a, and, and I, I don't think I actually mentioned it, but you know, our focus right now is running in a in a virtual environment. So we do testing in a bare metal environment. But you know, anybody that buys this product, they're running it in some sort of VM, KVM, ESXi, you know, Zen, whatever. Yeah, and this is where the hardware vendors can help out a bit because when you're in a VM, things like memory access, disk access, it's a the, the VM knows when it wants to do that access with a network packet it doesn't come in. So anything the hardware vendors think, he was talking about branch prediction. If you can do branch prediction when a package's coming in, <laughs> we'll all be pretty happy. Yeah. <laughs> and then MWH in ring three would be nice as well. Yes. Um, so I, I, um, I think another recent observation we've made was related to the, to the packet MBUF cache. Um, you know, it really is we haven't looked into it deeply, but it appears to be optimized for um, RX and TX on the same core. So we, we had done some experiments where we were, you know, moving RX and TX around. We've got multiple ports, so TX might, you know, RX may come in on one port, go out on another, and the TX is actually, you know, we're not running to completion. We actually have sort of a pipeline where TX may come out on another core. And, uh, you know, what we noticed is if we end up in a, in a situation where there's an imbalance between RX and TX, we, we had this situation where our, our RX, RX L core cache was being depleted, so it had to go to the, to the packet in buff pool. And the TX was, was exceeding its threshold, and so it had to be flushed out to the packet in buff pool. So we can end up with a situation where we're defeating the cache. Right, so, you know, we can, we have some control. I mean, we could look down into the situation. If we know how things are going in the system, we might actually be able to, at, at the application level, do allocations and freeze, you know, go over to the TX, wherever the TX is running, we might do um, an allocation over there and then send that back over to the RXL core. But it's hard to do this from the application level, so, it, you know, it, you know, maybe if we had some <laughs> APIs to monitor and manipulate this. Yeah. We see this. The pipeline we build has almost exactly the same syndrome. Yep. Right. There's actually a reasonably simple fix to it. Oh. So, um, so if you look at the underside of it, it's a ring. The underside of the cache is a ring. Mm -hmm. The other side of the cache needs to be a stack. If it's a stack, it will change the ground. So instead of a ring, go after a stack at the bottom, bottom end. This is something we can do. Uh, the other side of it is, uh, even though we don't actually change it, the TX doesn't really have any sort of bearing on the cache anyway. It, it's going to get flushed at some point. It's just a bulk flush. Reduce the cache size. Right now we don't have, allow that as a start sort of API, but the cache size is a per L core parameter. Yes. We just don't allow it as being modifiable L core. So we could put an API and you could reduce the size of the TX cache, which essentially means if you imply a stack underneath, you could keep more hot stuff in cache. Mm -hmm. LLC. So we, we could make those changes. Do you have an idea how much it would actually benefit you? Uh, not, not yet. We don't. So uh, a simple ex example, if you run two things in the same, same L core versus two different L cores, and just for a small packet pipe like this, do you see a large performance variation because of this? Uh, well, we have a couple applications where, yeah, we did. You um, did, right? And, and one of the issues we had was um, 
where we could actually uh, free a packet MBUF on a core that would never do an RX or a TX. Right. And so then they just stay there forever, right? Until maybe at some point you fill yeah. up that cache. So we, another thing was, how, you know, on that core, I don't want a cache. How do I just say no? Correct. Right? But, but the parameter is there. We just don't expose it. Right. Well, we went in and fixed it, okay. you know, just okay. under the covers to see if it, you know, and if we could prevent it from happening, and we right. could. Okay. That was just leaking away packet inbox until you filled that cache up. Yes. And it's, it's pretty large because... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Did you see, okay, you stopped making inbox, but did you see the performance impact due to not having the cache? Because that's, from, to my mind, one of the main reasons we have the cache is to stop hitting that shared resource for that rate. So, you know, if you've got Ornex allocations on one core, freeze happening on a different core, you're going to have this core to core cache line move passing the data pointers across, whether it's a stack or a ring. So you want your caches there so that you only do it again per 32, per 64, 256 packets. So I, I wonder, did you see any performance hit? Was your free of your MBOF running a lot slower, not going through this cache? Because every time you free the packet, you're actually hitting, doing a multi-producer push with a big, you know, compare and swap operation in the middle of it. Yeah, the, um, you know, our, our, our application at the moment right now, we, we run on one, when, when we run this code on in the VM, we run it on a single core. Uh, for the most part. Okay. Because so, uh, as I see, as with all core to core problems, you actually have two or three problems underneath it. Yeah, yeah. So the one problem is getting the pointer to the buffer across, yeah. which is where the MBUF caches come in and the ring comes in. And then you got your second problem of the actual buffer data itself and where it's cached. And as Venky was talking about it with the ring, as is with a ring structure rather than a cache, uh, or sorry, a stack. The, whatever the buffer is free, by the time it gets to the other end of the ring to be reallocated again, it's actually dropped out of your CPU cache. Right. So I'm wondering which which problem is actually worse in your case. Is it really a problem getting the pointers, or is it actually a problem of your data buffers in themselves? Yeah, and we need to do more analysis there. We actually, it was like a, a week ago that we started thinking about, well, <laughs> what is this problem, right? So this the observation we made was about a week ago, but we were we were just starting to look at how you know where the real issue is, what's the root of it, and then how many are there. So interestingly enough, right, there are two other applications that have exactly this problem. One's the pipeline. The pipeline tends to go pipeline tends to go core to core to core. Yeah, has exactly the same issue. The second one is OBS. OBS tends to do exactly the same thing. It has allocates on one core and then the eventual free might happen somewhere else. Right. Right, so uh, we do see that same particular syndrome. Uh, so I think we should look at trying to fix it uh, in some shape or fashion pretty quickly. We have the same problem. So I think this is, Bruce, this is something that we should look at. Well, we, we've started discussing it. Yep. Before. So we, we've discussed it for a while now, right? We know, we know there are applications that we have this particular thing. Yes. Yeah. I think I think there are three or four, two or three things we could do. So the, the the biggest problem you see is on a ring, you attach enough elements to the ring. Let's say 8K. At some point, they're going to fall out of cache, mm -hmm. which means the MBUF becomes a memory need, and you can actually measure the number of memory needs that happens. Uh, so maybe that's one thing we should look at: is that actually causing a limiter? Uh, because that we could see. You could actually see memory needs come back. Um, the second one would be the actual sizes of the caches themselves, and that's another interesting thing. The ultimate story is how can we get this footprint of the memory side down enough between you know, changing cache sizes, changing stacks, etc., so that you stay within a smaller memory footprint. Right. right. I think, Steve, this is something that we've talked about in the past as well, right? <laughs> yep. Similar problems. Okay. Yes, yeah, so thank you. Do you think uh, Broadworld DE can help with that, where you have a lot better control over yes. memory and cache? Yes. Yeah. So send me the results when you get them. <laughs> 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 well, no, Venki knows yeah, the framework we're using, yeah. so pipeline is fairly close yeah. to that. Okay, yeah. okay. good. Um,
You know, related to this was, you know, when we first saw the problem, we said, well, we'll just, we'll, maybe we need to just make our packet inbuff pool be bigger. Well, that didn't go very well. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, what we noticed was if we did nothing else but double the size of that pool, our performance, you know, went down, right? So I, okay, so everybody here already knew that. <laughs> uh, but, you know, so I don't know if there's, you know, obviously you want to use those local caches if you can, but sometimes you can't avoid it. So, you know, in the event that you have to go retrieve from it on, for Rx or you have to flush to it on uh, TX, you know, is that acting like a FIFO? Is it a, you know, is it, is it you know, well, at least recently used? It seems like if we make, the bigger we make it, you know, we're going to the oldest thing in that, that pool first. And, you know, maybe that's for reasons of avoiding locking yeah. or, you know, so, or ref counts or I don't know, but. No, so I, okay, so what we did, uh, so, so if you go back to dpdk 1.2, we had two FIFOs. The cache was a FIFO, the ring was a FIFO. Okay, so what we did in 1.3 was change the cache to a LIFO, but the ring is still a FIFO. Okay. The intent of it was, uh, the LIFO gives you, you know, lock to salloc, but there's more than lock to salloc, it gives you hot cache gives you hot MBUFs that are already in, likely in L1. But the FIFO gives you control to say, look, if I've got this packet that's essentially a TCP hack that I'm freeing back, I don't want to see it again because it's likely five milliseconds old. So I don't want to reuse that MBUF. That was the reason for the FIFO. So I think we've got different profiles of applications that want different things. So I think what we should do is probably attach different allocators and pick them depending on what your application so, wants. Yeah, right. So we can select it at a net time and say we want yes, this pool to we behave want this, this pool way. To behave this way. Okay. I think that's the probably the goal we should go after. If if anybody thinks different, speak up. But I think giving that flexibility is probably better for a lot of TCP type or long holding applications mm -hmm. that will essentially fall out of cache anyway. And if you put a LIFO in front of a TCP stack and said, hey, the next packet is something that I saw five milliseconds ago, that's going to be a problem as well. Okay, so, so <laughs> we've seen both sides of the application, it's just not one, unfortunately. Yes, and thank you. I, I think that's a theme. I just want to add one thing to this. So the ref, counts, ref count comes in a way, right? Because the, the, the MBUF is old and then you need to decrease your ref count. So. Actually, uh, from my point of view, I would love to see an option to get rid of ref counts because that's ruining my cache. <laughs> no, I, think, I, think we make it, I think we make it a little more flexible. You attach you know, a different handler for different things. I think that would be more ideal. Yeah, just an observation. I, I think a lot of DPDK, there's too much policy embedded in the mechanism. And we've got to try and pull that out, return codes, these type of things, you know, per core um, allocators. It's too little policy. We'd like more streamlined to do certain things in one way and only one way. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll that's, that's, that. a good, that's a good comment for WaveCon and the others. There are too many things that become, so that TMBs become too much complex. And we are writing an application on top of that. And in our applications, we are already managing these data. And why do they show up in RTM if we don't care? If we need it in application, we, 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 we have feed, we have quite data structure to wrap it and we, we, we manage it. But please don't keep uh, uh, adding more, more, more knobs. knobs. Yeah, more knobs. So, so, so we went away from this in the past, right? So what about two different MBUF structures? 164 by minimal, one more, you know, more application driven, more complicated. Would that be something that we would consider? Why? See? So, so again, remember, different applications deal with different things in different ways. Some applications like more complicated, more beefier structures, some don't. Yeah. The routing application honestly doesn't care. Yeah, but on, in the application, we, we take care of, let's say, the extended needs of the Some do, some don't. So, um, if I could jump in here. So it sounds like what you're saying is that it really isn't even applications. It's the, it's the type of traffic yeah. that could change. So even if the application is OVS in one hand, if we're handling big packets, 
we need to tune it a different way in majority. On the other hand, if we're handling small packets, we need to tune it. So some of the optimization for small packets is actually decreasing our um, potential performer for large packets because of this cash problem. So, so that's a case in point, right? But for something like DSO, we need to carry. For DSO, we need to carry more data. If you want to have something that does DSO, it's going to be more data. You do it in the application, right? You do it in six minute game. But OVS for Vert.io will need to carry it through the MBuff. So, so you have two different <laughs> profiles of stuff. So I think you know, at some point we, we did this, we went away from it, and we actually took packet MBuff, control MBuff, and broke it back to one common structure. Maybe just go back to an overloaded structure and you know, essentially a version one, version two MBuff, and you use one of those two. That's an interesting way of looking at it. Or find an extensible way of looking at it. We've got to find something that will service both sides. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a trade-off between, you know, the KISS principle, right? You know, keep it simple. Uh, and having the flexibility to do what you need to do, right? So applications, different applications need different behaviors. So I don't think we'll be, we'll, we'll answer that question today. <laughs> But, you know, that's going to be an ongoing discussion. I think, you know, there are going to be trade-offs every step of the way. No, it is something to think about. I think yeah, we think yeah. about it as a community as to what we want. Yeah, yeah. We just want it to go faster. <coughs> uh, so I'm, I'm sure everybody uh, probably already knows this, too. But, you know, it was a discovery process for us. So, you know, one of the things that we, we learned, initially we started off with IGB and then we went, uh, IFGBE and then IFGBEVF uh, as we were allowed to. And, you know, one of the things we, we discovered was, well, you know, all, all PMDs are not created equal. Um, they don't all implement all of the APIs. Um, and we got alarmed at first when we discovered this because we, we happened to be using an API. That API wasn't implemented across all of the Polmo drivers, so when we, we first tried um, I think it was uh, VMX Net3 or actually VF, and we were calling RX QCount. I have a presentation about both those drivers related to the uh, Polmo drivers. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so the implementation would be awesome uh, to, to have that. But the other, the, you know, the one point is the fact that, you know, there's, 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 a, there's a hole there where if, if, if the protection mechanism wasn't implemented, you can just fall off the face of the earth. Uh, yeah. Um, this information is very useful, I think, for everyone. Would you consider to contribute this kind of table in the documentation? Sure. Oh, sure. Thank you. But it's, it, the only drawback to it is it's a static thing, so I looked at it, uh, I think that's from DPDK 1.8 when I went through that. So that's the only, it, it would be nice actually to have a way to generate this table automatically so that, you know, we could go through and it, yeah, it, it, it's not hard, it just takes time. Right. Does, it, does it mean that for, for new drivers evolution on the DPDK, we should enforce a minimum, and if it's not there, then we keep asking to the driver provider? I think that's one. Yeah, yeah, I think that's one thing. Another thing we could do is a different mechanism of of handling the problem. So today, it's you 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 opt in to to detecting that there's a there's a null pointer in that vector table, right? If some if if the DPDK infrastructure, if the RTE API actually goes and checks that there's a null pointer there and it may then return an error, why not take the table when the POMO driver registers, it gives you the table of function vectors, walk through it. If there are any null entries in that table, put a stub in there. So that means you've got to have a stub for every API, but then if somebody happens to call that, you know, they're going to get some sort of error from the stub that says, you know. Right. Actually, you could, so Steve, you could do this without yeah, having that particular problem, problem, right? Yeah. No, but I think that's a good suggestion. I think we need to figure some way of at, at least enforcing a minimum. Well, hmm. the other one is I think the driver register function should just you should try to register the don't have to. Right, so you could you, you could do that. I mean that. that
create another interaction. Well, but the point is that if, if there's some sort of ones that we just expect people to do, like you need to have a queue release function because it, even if you stub it, that's fine, but we're not going to take care of you. Um, when you register the driver, you should just say, no, I'm not going to let you do it. Yeah, but no. so Steve, the logical extension there is the, what we talked about yesterday, live migration, right? Yeah. I need a certain set of functions that must be implemented for live migration. Right. If it's not there, it's not going to migrate. And we, by the way, these are some drivers, and it's kind of shocking that that's all Intel drivers, by the way, just FYI, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, but there's more that have different yeah. APIs. Yeah, yeah. Right? And even we have that big a variation is kind of, well, that you know, when when I, when I first made that chart and I saw all the red in it, I got really worried. Uh, yeah. By the way, it, it also shows you one thing, right? Even within Intel, our focus is that one green line. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and we noticed that. So it's an interesting problem. Yes. Um, but it is one that we have to fix. Okay. It's just how do you get everybody to agree on what that minimum subset is? Because everybody's. Yeah. Of course everyone wants something different, yeah. but we, we've got to, at least let's, if you look at the kernel, the kernel does this today, okay, there's nothing, no reason why it shouldn't be done here too. Okay. Um. I mean, I think these are things that probably everyone everyone already knows, you know, it, and it was illustrated by that previous slide that the POMO drivers are all at various levels, levels of maturity. So, you know, if you're coming into the DPDK community, it's important to be aware of that, that, you know, they don't, they're not all the same maturity as the NIC driver or, or the kernel level <coughs> driver. And, you know, those that exist in DPDK are not at the same level of maturity. Um, and sometimes it's hard to find out, you know, if I want to use VMXNet 3, you know, just what's it missing, right? Um, so you got, you got limited visibility into the capabilities of, of the Polmo driver. I don't, I don't know that there's a good way to solve that because it, it's sort of the, the same problem of what features are baseline, what do you have to have, and, and do we have APIs to actually determine what that baseline is. So, you know, for example, you know, VMXNet3 today, and Stephen has a patch, we tried it, it worked for us, but it doesn't support Jumbo today. Um, so, you know, there's no way to know that other than you've been through the code or you've tried it and it doesn't work. Um, well, I think we need a real driver test because there's a whole lot of other things too, like graph counts, indirect buffers, um, you know, change the buffer size, you know, what's the maximum change you get when you get, a lot of those things we aren't testing for. Um, maybe Intel has a magic test suite, but no. No, but, but Steve, you bring up an interesting point, right? Um, so the general philosophy we followed is that if you have you know, specific acceleration in those drivers for specific things, build your own. But it also means that we've got to figure out how to allow the capabilities to be discovered, which we don't have, um, and some baseline that we actually need to agree on. Yes. Um, you know, uh, another thing that we noticed was, and I, and I know I kind of keep picking on the IHGBE driver here, but, uh, you know, limited visibility. Some, some POMO drivers have multiple modes of operation, and some POMO drivers decide on their own what that operation mode is. So, for example, you know, if, if you enable, if you build with, uh, with vector mode on IHGBE, then you know, the IXGB poll mode driver decides when it's going to turn it on or, or not based on what the NIC can do, right? There, the only way you can know that is if you happen to go look at the, if, if you have access to, which may be a problem in a deeply embedded system, to the, to the log output, the printf output of that driver, right? He, he sent it out to standard out, but who knows where that went in your application. Um, so there, there needs to be a way, I think, to be able to determine you know what what mode this if it runs in multiple modes then there's got to be some way to get to that data so Sorry. that the application can at least um, detect whether or not it's running in this you know 
in this mode of that. Sorry, can I just ask, why does the application need to know that? Because certainly with the IXGBE driver, I mean, you, you've got a set of flags that specify the conditions you're going to run on, whether you need jumbo frame support or not, Be because and we just pick the best mode that meets your constraints. Because my application runs on anybody's server. I have no idea what they have, and when it comes back with a problem, I need to be able to so say, go hit the CLI and tell me what happened. So Bruce, interestingly, a simple one, right? Very simple thing. I need to service X million packets per second. So I do one core or two cores to do it. Depending on the vector driver or not vector driver, you get essentially two different numbers. Yeah. Right. So, so but, they but for a given application, it needs you know it either needs jumbo frame support or not, or it needs you know these various offloads, which is what the, it's the support of those offloads that Correct. determines whether we use vector but driver it's, or it's not. But it's a little more complicated. And right? if if you need those offloads, knowing whether or not you're using the vector driver isn't going to make any difference because if you need the offloads, no, you can't use it. So when they're trying to satisfy an SLA, it does because they need to know how many cores to or threads to allocate for whatever functions they're dealing with. And they don't know that because it's the system underneath is indeterminate. So, so if it's okay. going to deliver you packets in 20 cycles or 40 cycles or 60 cycles, they need to know yeah. that part. But that's not going to vary from application instance to application instance. Uh, it yes, might. It will. My it application will. instance might, might run on your box or somebody else's box. Yeah. So they may have different But mix, if right? you're running, if your application uses certain features, okay, it will always run with driver A or driver B. Absolutely. Okay, the vector or non-vector. And it doesn't matter what the hardware is, the CPU is underneath, if you're using that a dry, uh, Niantic NIC with that IXGB driver for your application with your given offloads, it's always going to be on the vector and non-vector path, irrespective of the and CPU that underneath. Yes, that's right. But how do I know that if, if I have a customer that's having a problem and, I, and I, maybe there's a bug in the vector driver? I can't even tell you that he was running the vector driver. <laughs> By the way, which, which there was. Checksum. The checksum flag ah. wasn't being set on the vector driver and there was a performance inversion in a bunch of places. That was a little bit challenging to debug. Right. It's because I don't own the hardware, right? So I can't, and I need to be able to detect that okay. in order to support that environment. It's, so it's, in this case, this is where the user may have tuned the offloads that you need. Well, the user doesn't. Uh, the user put a VM on a box that has a NIC in it. Okay. So, so the, uh, by the way, the perfect test case for this is OBS, right? OBS doesn't care to hoot about what drivers bound underneath as long as DBDK NetDev sits there. It expects that DBDK NetDev has negotiated all this stuff. Correct. Okay. But what I'm just worried about is if you know it's Niantic NIC and you know your application, do you not know which path it's going to take based on that? We don't know it's a Niantic NIC. Okay, well that's, that's fact, different, but that's different they, to knowing which No, but they don't care what NIC is sitting there, to be quite honest. Yeah. And by the way, the other side is, there's not one version of Niantic NICs, right? There's four of them, there's five of them, and there's four twill, and there's five of them, and... But that, that's, that's a different question, though, to whether it's using the Orex scattered or the Orex path. No, agreed. But I think it's, it comes down to the same thing about querying what your device is capable of doing, supporting that. Okay. So a, a, general a general API that tells yeah. you it's using this Rx function, this TX function, sounds like it may be more specifically what you need because that will also tell you the driver yeah, as well as the actual yeah. function within the driver. Well, but it could be totally PMD specific, right? You can have one PMD, could be two scheduled functions, like we have for some time for HP, because one just got together and another scheduled plus other row. Okay. Tell you which it is. Right. So it's a it's a thing Yeah. So um so it sounds like to summarize that we can have uh, side effects of really remarkable changes in performance as we migrate uh, a computer node that has open vSwitch running from one server to another to the cloud and it's going to behave differently even though they're both running VPDK, even though they both have supported NICs because uh, some NIC might make a different decision in terms of how it's going to um, optimize as opposed to the other NIC, and the user, whoever is looking at the packet performance, will see some variation in performance, and it's going to be very difficult to explain why. 
um, I don't know what to do about it, but I want to, But that sounds like what we're talking about. And this is you're naming one case with the Niantic, right? But there's it, it's going to show up um, yeah. so in, in a number of different cases, especially in the encapsulator world, right? So there are certain versions of Niantic <coughs> called VX lines, there are certain that don't. So if you had a VX oh. line interpreted story, you, you should be able to figure out which ones do which ones don't without looking at the LSPCI. Right. That's that's what we're actually ultimately trying to get to is can we to the upper layers, to the application that uses a VXLAN protocol stack inside, tell them that hey look that's supported, not supported. Today it's a guess. And and this it, it has an impact across the system eventually. Yes, I think it, it comes down to who the application is, because later on I'll talk about controllers. You know, we, we have other things as a controller. So all this low-level stuff that people are talking about now, it means nothing to a controller where a service provider says, I'm going to deploy this path based on the number of dollars you pay. Mm -hmm. So it, we, we, we need a capabilities discovery. You've got to look at where you are in the stack to say what's relevant. So, Correct. Yeah. And I'm sorry just to re repeat, but exactly what you said before. When you are on Linux, it's your user cannot drive us. You run ETH tool and you have the answers. You know if the, if the uh, interface does VX and offload, that is peer load, that does checksum offloads, and everything is gone just because we have cut and pasted the driver to the user now. So when when you read all that documentation, I'm not to answer to your question, Thomas. The documentation is 10 years. Here is use ETH tools who have information. Mm -hmm. So, and and uh, I I heard yesterday that uh, I think it was Bruce to my, maybe to, to try to to synchronize the kinase. So, okay, we are going to have some more complexity in the synchronization mechanisms that may even create sometimes some race conditions uh, for that uh, because we keep having this, this design. So I, I just keep repeating the same thing, but it's another. It's once again uh, another issue because of, of this, uh, the, the way the drivers are. Okay. I just wanted to raise the point. So it, it, uh, we, we can keep fixing on top of that with ETH tool extensions and so on, and we can extend your ETH tool proposal to have this information because you, you, you'll have it uh, with, from ETH tool. So is it the way we should go, or should we uh, uh, no, try to clean it from the other kind? Of right. I, I don't know the answer. Uh, uh, I, 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 I guess <laughs> I it. We, we, it means that. So, uh, so everyone doing the need drivers, it's, uh, we, we need to tell them, and Mr. Intel, Mr. Celsius, please, please stop. Yes. No, I no, that, so, I, so that's not going to be the way it will work, right? You have to build it, fix this from the ground up. This is this needs to be fixed inside DPDK. You can't say, I'll rely on the Linux kernel, because the Linux kernel is not what you will run sometimes. Right. We're not a Linux kernel only system. Let's be quite blunt about that part too. When I am on BSD, I can have the same APIs to the packets. I mean, Microsoft are proposing APIs to the packets. So uh, all the, the, the vendors can have the API, and, and, and in each operating system, there are tools to monitor the, the network ports. No, not exactly. So, I mean, I, I, uh, we are not going to talk about, uh, I hope, bare metal DPDK. I mean, we are, no, I it's, not, it's, it's not only really about that, Vincent. It, there's a lot of operating systems that do things very, very differently. In fact, there are a lot of embedded use cases that don't actually even run Linux or BSD or Windows or something else. There are systems like that. So, I mean, this is not something that we can we can not not avoid. It's something we need to do. Yes. So healthy debate. Healthy debate. I mean, then your time, huh? No, no, no. Okay. Well, the, <laughs> the rest of this slide is pretty much the same sort of thing. So we, well, we've actually been through that one all. Another thing, this, you know, Andy mentioned, you know, embedding, embedding policy in, in DPDK. Here's another example where sometimes the choice is made, you know, down at a very low level that, you know, this something's gone wrong. I'm going to exit. I'm going to abort. I'm going to panic. You know that's not good in a in a in a product. You know, in in some applications, the application might still function. Um, you know, maybe I've got other interfaces that aren't under the control of DBDK that I can you know or administrative uh, 
um, interfaces that you know some administrator is using to figure out what the heck happened to this box. Why is it not working? But it can't because the application actually went down. You know, so you know there needs. I, I think um, you know we we need to provide a mechanism for the application to set the failure policy. Um, you know, another thing, and I'm trying to move a little more quickly is. Not all drivers, uh, Polmo drivers, for example, report errors. So again, I picked IXGBVF. Sorry about that, Bruce. Um, <laughs> but but one of the things we noticed, we were trying to um, we were trying to change the MPU, uh, and for various reasons on the host side, the PS said no, you can't do that. The VS said okay, uh, I got a knack from from the PS, and it said yep, I did it. Right, so now I've, you know, changed the MTU. As far as my application is concerned, the MTU has been changed, but really it hasn't. And in the extreme case where we were running here, we had a, we had a, uh, we were running ESXi with a vSwitch, and, and the result of it was not that we couldn't get packets of the MTU size that we set, but that we could get no packets in or no packets out. That's not a DPDK problem. But the fact that we didn't even know, we couldn't, we had no way to fix it, right? Now, yeah, we could look at that particular case and we could go back and turn around and read the MTU and the MTU, you know, maybe hopefully we'd find out that it didn't actually apply the change. But the reality is, you know, we need that information back up in the application. Um, the other thing that, that I, I mentioned earlier about, you know, when we were talking about um, whether the IXGB was in vector mode or not, well, you can look at the output, the printf output, you know, it'll tell you that. It prints it out if you can get to it. In our particular application, we have a pretty sophisticated logging system. Things don't from standard out don't go into that logging system because we use a whole different mechanism, right? So can you redirect RTE log to something else. Yeah, they don't all use RTE log. RTE log, yes. Printf, you know, maybe we could override printf. It should never be a printf. Yeah, so so I, I think just making sure that everybody's using RTE log that we can over you know, that then we can bind into that. So we'll we'll definitely look to make sure we So I, I thought that was the I didn't think there were printouts coming out of anywhere underneath. Uh, if there are, we should fix them. There, there are some. I, I, I'd have to go back and look. You know, maybe it was coming out of some of the sample code. Uh, sample apps have them. Yeah, sample apps have them. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, the library yeah. shouldn't. The library yeah. Should. yeah. yeah. I'll double check when I get back. It's an easy fix. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Well, I just uh, look in the ACL code. It has lots of printers. There you go. <laughs> I, I had a script that was was pulling them all out. I thought that it came out in other places besides the sample code, but I couldn't remember for sure. Uh, again, you know, I, I don't know. How many people in the room use DPDK in a 32-bit application? So most people don't, right? So all of you people that don't, remember that there are those of us out here that do. Uh, and, you know, so it's a challenge, actually, if you're, you're one of the few people doing 32-bit stuff. Um, you know, we're the few who test it. Okay, I gotta go. Uh, so, you can look at the slides later. Yeah, Andy, yeah. Andy doesn't want to talk. Um, uh, you know, dynamic linking is assumed. I, you know, we, one of the things I noticed, or we hit, was when the Polmo driver uh, registration was moved into constructors, you know, things suddenly didn't work. I had no Polmo driver. I had no NICs anymore. Where did they all go? Well, you know, you need to take special care if you're linking static libraries. So, for any of you out there that are using them, have you already encountered this? Maybe you have. If not, maybe that'll help you. Um, and again, I mentioned earlier, you know, just supporting legacy tools, kernels, that can be a challenge too. So, you know, things, you know, we'll, we'll find, you know, a new header file that's being used that's not available to us. Um, I think one of the problems those of us that are using sort of legacy environments have is how do we handle that in a graceful way. So, you know, if, if the header file that's being included in some DPDK code and we can't support that in our environment, how do we disable that in a way that's acceptable to the community? You know, we want a conditional 
compilation all over the place, so what's the best approach? Um, so, uh, moving forward, I mentioned earlier, you know, we, we had for a long time been kind of drinking from the DPDK fire hose. We've, you know, found some issues. We've worked pretty closely with Intel and with Larry in particular to, to get those things pushed back. So a lot of this stuff, any of the, the fixes, you know, the being able to do multiple threads per L-Core, some of the NUMA stuff, some other things have all been pushed back up or in the process of being so. Um, but, you know, for us as Cisco, and is, you know, we need to start contributing back and standing on our own two feet. So that's, that's our goal, and our plan. You know, like the guys from Ericsson here said, you know, we work in a big, big corporation, right? So there's challenges and things move slowly, but that's what we're working towards. Um, so that, you know, we can start, you know, committing, uh, contributing directly both feature-wise and bug-wise, bug-fix-wise. Thomas? Yeah. Um. That's great to hear that you, you are going to contribute some bug fixes and enhancements, so it will solve some of your issues. But um, there are some issues about some design rules uh, or make the community aware of some uh, issues. Uh, I think you can also fix this kind of problem by submitting some patches for the documentation. Uh, if, you, if you want to enforce uh, some design, or rule, you, you can publish it in, uh, in the documentation. Okay. And uh, about other issues, uh, like um, some drivers and uh, the wrong error, uh, it can also be been fixed by making more reviews, actually. And you, we, we are looking for reviewers. Yes. So <laughs> you are very welcome. Yeah, <laughs> so yes, it, yes it, it, you're right. I, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and and you know we want to applaud your efforts because you know I watch you on that mailing list, but it's a it, it's a full time job just to keep up with you, you know just watching the emails fly by. It is it is. I have one the fun. Yeah. I have one ah. Uh, one. Okay. <laughs> when and so we hope we can help. We hope we can. We have uh, one bank as well. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. So that's all I had. I'm gonna. Switch over for you, Andy. Let me uh, get out of this presentation. You just so uh, hang on, just a second. Yeah, let me.